big welcome to our guest speaker tonight. Great pleasure to introduce um, Mariana Moffat, uh, who is an MSc, a Master of Science Communication candidate uh, in the Department of um, Science Communication, I think it was called, isn't it? Now, uh, Mariana, you'll remember, uh, gave a wonderful talk um, earlier about the uh, Monroe uh, family connection with Edinburgh and the three uh, successive professors of anatomy in the University of Edinburgh, uh, Monroe, Primus, Secundus, and Tertius. So um, it's also an important connection with the Monroe collection of books which are in the university library and tremendous resource that we have, very grateful to have, which represents um, the library and other documents related to those Monroe professors. So Mariana has been researching that, the earlier uh, connections, but also has followed it up with the next generation of Monroes. And so um, I'm very excited to uh, hear what Mariana has to say tonight about Sir David Munro, who, as we'll learn, is a descendant and relative of the earlier Munros. But Mariana, thank you. Well, good evening and welcome. Tena koto, tena koto, tena koto katoa. Dobro večer i dobrodošli. It is my great pleasure to be here again and to talk about another of my favorite men in the history of both New Zealand and medicine. And this time we are talking about Sir David Monroe. He is the Monroe of the Monroes. And if you have uh, had the opportunity to uh, listen to my last year's lecture from Scotland with Love, the Monroes and their collection, I would warmly invite you to have a look at it. There is a short documentary also about the lives of the Monroes and our beautiful special collection that is um, housed at the uh, special collections in the University of Otago Library. Uh, before I proceed with the lecture itself, I would like to make several acknowledgements. First of all, I would like to acknowledge my Department of Science Communication and uh, its uh, um, head of department, Professor Jesse Bering, who is uh, th throughout the program continuously inspiring me to tell compelling and interesting stories. Also, I would like to acknowledge the um, history program at Massey University, um, uh, particularly Professor Michael Belgrave, uh, Associate Professor Kirsty Carpenter, uh, Dr. Karen Gillings and Associate Professor Jeff Watson uh, for uh, allowing me to have uh, an opportunity to uh, listen to some of the postgraduate papers in the history program. And above all, I would like to give a very warm welcome to the Monroe family descendants, who I believe are in uh, quite a large number with us tonight over Zoom. Without further ado, I think it's our time to talk about Sir David Monroe, uh, a figure that has been just as important and prominent in New Zealand history as was the case with his ancestors back in Scotland. If you recall my last year's lecture, I provided a pedigree of the Monroes, and that was from Alexander Inglis' uh, books, uh, The Monroes. Uh, and here we have some highlighted areas. Don't worry, I didn't highlight it in the, in the book itself. I just printed it off. And so uh, what I wanted to show you is the five generations that I would like to uh, point out in their importance in the life of Sir David Mondra. So to start with, here we've got Sir Alexander uh, Beercroft, then we've got John Monroe, uh, Alexander Primus, Alexander, Alexander Monroe Primus, Secundus Tertius, and here we've got our 
Sir David Monroe. Now, what do we see here? Uh, We've got John Monroe, and later I will tell just very briefly about each of them, uh, and that he had only one surviving child, which was Primus. Uh, so he, as a single parent, he dedicated his life to uh, making sure that he provides a bright future for his son. Uh, Primus had... Uh, 12 children, Secundus had five, and uh, uh, Titius had 12 children. So it is very interesting to see why did they have so many children and what is so specific about them. And here they are, the five Monroes, the, the Monroes, the five generations uh, that have had a very great influence on Sir David. One of them I particularly like to emphasize is Sir Alexander Monroe of Beercrofts. Uh, he is the one, if you remember from previous lecture, he is the one that was on the brink of execution only a few years later to be knighted. I think based on his role model, his life and his resilience, he was the um, ideal of how one should behave in their life. Never give up and always strive for the better. Then we have John Monroe. This is the photo that we've got of John Monroe. He was a surgeon. He wasn't a medical graduate, but he was a surgeon. And he was the one that uh, sent his son to Leiden to be in the company of Boerhaave, his friend, and to learn the craft of anatomy and medicine over there. So while, while uh, Primus was studying in Holland, in Leiden, uh, Mondra was working in the background with the town council advocating that uh, Edinburgh should establish a school of medicine. Of course, bearing in mind to uh, path to, to pave a, a road for his son to become the first professor and lecturer of anatomy, and he succeeded. So here we've got uh, Alexander Monro Primus, who was the first professor of anatomy at the School of Medicine at the University of Edinburgh. Primus was a very industrious student. He was very literate. He uh, had an excellent command of Latin, French, um, Dutch, German, Greek, uh, and uh, all those uh, natural history sciences that um, one could learn. He was very good at drawing, and so he would send to his father uh, drawings of the uh, human body that he did during dissections in Leiden. Of course, John made sure that uh, those who needed to see in order to secure his future saw those drawings. Uh, Primus was a very detailed person. He also wrote about the history of his family. And on the second page of the uh, life of uh, Dr. Alexander Monroe in his own handwriting, we, we hear the story about Sir Alexander Monroe of Beercrofts and about his resilience. And that was, as I was reading it, that, that sparked to my mind as something that was very important. And later on, even in the writings of the, um, Sir, Sir David Monroe, we will see how important Sir Alexander Monroe and his role model was. Then we, we come to... Alexander Monroe Secundus, who was the most prominent professor, excuse me, of anatomy of his time. He is now um, known for his uh, Foramen Monroe, but also for uh, uh, Monroe Kelly doctrine. But what is most, most important, he was a brilliant lecturer. He was so dedicated. He was a very prolific writer. He was everywhere, but he was not just famous in the world of medicine. He was de he dedicated himself also to his community, so he was a member of various body. Uh, he was a very uh, keen um, 
gardener. He loved theaters. Uh, music was something that uh, he uh, took very kindly to. So he was, we would say, a man of many talents. And this is something that his um, great, uh, his grandson, sorry, uh, David would also inherit from him. The last of the five generations in, in here is um, Alexander Monratius. Now, people don't speak overly kindly about the lecture uh, by Alexander Monratius as a lecturer. He was more known and he enjoyed more uh, practicing surgery and uh, physiology than anatomy. However, he had to follow the rules of um, generational tradition, so to, to say, and he was also the third professor of anatomy. Uh, when he resigned, well, they say resigned, uh, he ended, it sounds a little bit dramatic, but he ended 126 years of chairing the anatomy by the Monroes. Actually, he was a 75-year-old man, and he just came to the retirement. He just didn't want to, to carry on, so he wasn't really ending the tradition. He, he just went to his retirement, rightly so. So what is so specific about Sir David? Well, he was born on the 27th of March in 1813, at 30th St. Andrew Square. This was Secundus's house. It, it is in Edinburgh, and he was the seventh child. Uh, there were four sons uh, of 12 children. When we, if we go back here to the pedigree, here we will see that uh, Sir David comes forth. But what is very interesting, what I find interesting is that when they did the pedigrees, they put first the male sons first and then daughters, even though that's not how the order was. So here we have the first girl was Maria. She was born in 1801. Then came Alexander. So we have another Alexander. That was a tradition that we have Alexander Primus, Alexander Secundus, Alexander Tertius. But although Tertius had son Alexander, there is no Alexander Quartus. There is no Alexander Quintus, which is a little bit unusual. So um, Maria was the first one, then Alexander, 1803, Catherine, 1804, James, 1806, Georgiana, 1808, Henry, called Harry, 1810, Sir David, 1813, William, 1815, Harriet, 1816, Charles, 1818. He died very early at the age of two. Then was Isabella, 1819, and Charlotte, 1821. What do we see here? What was the domestic life like in uh, 19th century Scotland? Here we have, for example, um, uh, Tertius got married in 1800. The first child was born in 1801. The last child was born in 1821. So 12 children were born within a 20 year period, which makes every child was born around 1.5 years apart. Um, that would have been a huge burden to any woman even nowadays in the current uh, modern um, day and age, uh, let alone in the 19th century. Obviously, they were very well off and they could provide for such a large family. So they lived with Secundus. Secundus died in 1817 when David was only four. By the time David was born, uh, we have, so he was the seventh child. So David was born, seven children were there, Secundus was there, Tertius and his wife, which would make the household of 12 people. Can you imagine living in the house, even if it was the size of a hotel, it would still be crowded. So yes, it, it, it probably wasn't 
overly perfect because uh, at that time when um, Tertius moved with his wife, uh, Secundus already suffered from several strokes, so he really needed look after. Uh, his wife died earlier, so he needed some help with his, with his health. And well, the family of seven children, sorry, nine children at that time, uh, I don't think uh, would be would be a, a such quiet place to live. Once Secundus died in 1817, a family moved to uh, 121 George Street, or they spent a lot of time in the country estate called, called Craig Lockhart. Uh, that estate is outside of uh, Edinburgh. I think it is uh, currently it is one of the suburbs with the development of Edinburgh nowadays, it would be one of the suburbs. But um, it is with such a with such household where there are so many children, I believe that David probably was not going along with everybody the same way. Some were much younger, some were much older than him. So what he did was, as they moved to, um, uh, as they moved to the new place, uh, they lived very close to the Queen Street Gardens, where he met a boy of his own age called William Edmonstone Itone from 21 Abercrombie Place. They will forge a lifelong uh, friendship. Uh, they were the same age, they would go to the same school. The only time that they would part would be when uh, David decided to move to New Zealand and little William decided to stay in Edinburgh later. He became a very uh, famous Scottish poet. He also taught rhetorics and belle lettres at the University of Edinburgh, but he was also a trained uh, lawyer. The little boys, they spent a lot of time together. They went fishing, swimming in the Leith River, and they really enjoyed each other's company. In 1824, at the age of 11, a new Edinburgh Academy was established, and they were the foundation pupils. Boys like boys weren't overly enthusiastic about um, learning, about studying, getting excellent marks, unlike, unlike his uh, ancestors, uh, Secundus and Primus. So uh, little David, he was in the golden middle. So they had in the first year 49 pupils enrolled. He was the 12th, which is not overly bad. And in the final year, that he completed at the age of 15 in 1828, he was sixth out of 20. Well, as I said, golden medal, golden medal, sorry. After completing the Edinburgh Academy, so at the age of 16, uh, so that would be something like our high school from 16 to 18, in 1822 period to 1830, Again, together with Itone, he enrolled at the university, but it wasn't university, university. As I said, it was more like high school where he studied chemistry, botany, and natural history. Again, they were together at school, so they spent a lot of time together. And this is probably where we see a lot about his uh, affiliation toward uh, outdoor life. So they went tramping, shooting, fishing, they went to a um, Orkney Island trip where they really enjoyed the outdoor and nature that has to offer. On the other hand, just like his um, predecessors, uh, he enjoyed music very much and they used to, particularly in winter times, they used to organize some amateur amateur theatricals at um, a 21 Abercrombie place where, where William lived with his family. Uh, I found a very interesting information in which uh, it said that they would enact uh, Julius Caesar, Shakespeare's Julius Caesar play and uh, they would entertain people at 21 Abercrombie place 
And the only complaint that uh, little David had because he had to make the sword himself. Now, I, if I compare it to the current generation, I wonder how many of uh, young ones uh, uh, have read Shakespeare, Julius Caesar, let alone how many of them enacted uh, in, the, in the home theater. Well, so much of the educational system. Uh, in 1831, he went to the north of England uh, to a home of a clergyman where he studied Greek, Latin, algebra, and the logic of Aristotle. What does that tell us? That tells us that uh, the educational system in those days was very comprehensive. So before they even enrolled to the university, what we consider nowadays university, they already had a very good understanding and very good command of all the natural uh, natural subjects, uh, including the languages, maths, logic, philosophy, uh, anything that would prepare them for the university life. Now, here when we talk about the period between 1828 to 1830, uh, if we recall, that was the time when uh, something very dramatic happened in Edinburgh, and here I'm referring to anatomy murders. So in that period, 1828 to 1829, uh, William Hare and William Booth, they uh, performed a series of killings in order to supply fresh bodies for the uh, Robert Knox's extramural classes in anatomy. Despite all those gruesome murders, uh, it did not put off young David to enroll in the medicine. So in the period 1832, and please let not forget that that is the year when the Anatomy Act was adopted, uh, defining uh, who and how the bodies can be obtained for the dissection at the university, for the university lectures. So in the period of 1832 to 1835, uh, David studied medicine at the School of Medicine, University of Edinburgh. So he was very much at home. His inaugural thesis was on aneurysm of thoracic aorta. And at the age of 22, he graduated uh, with a degree of Doctor of Medicine, along with 116 other medical students. That was the, uh, the time when very many students still uh, went to study medicine uh, from abroad particularly, although in the coming years, the number of students would start going a little bit down. The, the uh, time of golden medicine, golden Scottish medicine, was at the height of the time when uh, Secundus was the teacher. Once he completed his studying and he got his degree, just like his father, grandfather, great-grandfather, he went traveling abroad and he wanted to have a little bit of adventure to see what is happening in the continent. And he, just like his ancestors, he wanted to further his studies. So he went to Paris and spent oh, about just over a year from spring 1836 to autumn 30. Uh, 1837. Then he went to Gottingen. He met Professor Blumenthal, uh, spent five weeks in Berlin, went to Vienna, Tyrol, and Switzerland. And in 1838, five years later, sorry, three years later, he went back to Edinburgh. And what is also very interesting is that, uh, yes, he was traveling a lot, but at the, at the same time, David was writing his diaries. Uh, he, was, um, he always had a journal with him. He was drawing, taking notes. He was very, very um, meticulous in 
recording everything that has been going on. And thanks to him, his letters, his diaries and journals, we know a lot about his life and the life around him in that time period. So by the time his troubles came to an end, it was time to get a job. So in 1838, upon Tertius's recommendation, he was appointed assistant in anatomy. And that sounds very familiar, doesn't it? Because this is how Secundus got a, a, a teaching position. He was conjoined uh, professor with his father, Primus. And then the Tertius was appointed upon recommendation of his father, conjoined um, uh, position of a conjoined professor. And now we get also the young David to be his father's assistant in anatomy. So making sure there is a continuation of the line of professors. However, yes, David spent a little bit of time there uh, in the period between 1839 to 1840. He was involved in extramural teaching of anatomy to students of fine arts. And despite him being a graduate medical professional, graduate doctor of medicine. I think he spent a lot of time uh, in the nature, looking at uh, various plants, uh, flora, uh, drawing, um, doing maths, calculating, uh, um, and not only being in the in anatomy world. Then a decision to move to New Zealand came, and this is where we don't know much about what caused it. At the time, when he decided to move, his brother Harry was already in Australia, and I will talk about his Australia visit a little bit later. But now we've got a decision to move to New Zealand, uh, and in 1841, he purchased from New Zealand company uh, four land allotments in a Nelson settlement for 1,200 pounds. He didn't have those money and he got a loan from his father Tertius, 2,000 pounds with uh, expected time spent in New Zealand of 10 years. So initially he didn't expect to stay longer than 10 years in New Zealand. But believe me, there is something so magical and enchanting about New Zealand that even I have found myself already being 15 years here and it's still magical. What is very interesting, he didn't have the money to uh, buy those four uh, allotments of land. So his father said, yes, I'm happy to lend it to you, but you, uh, uh, um, in my will, you will receive £2,000 less. So that was the deal. Yes, you can have it now. It was like um, lend in advance. It was like inheritance in advance. So in the will, uh, Tertius's will, he got £2,000 less than the others. He decided to leave Scotland on 11th of May, 1841. And that was about uh, four months earlier, six months earlier, than the rest of the settlers who were uh, intending to move to New Zealand. And his intention was to visit his brother Harry in Australia. Uh, it is interesting to know that uh, in these in these days, uh, the trip from the shores of Glasgow or from Edinburgh um, took four months at sea. So can you imagine staying with thousands of other people or how, however many were in, in the particular boat for four months at the same time? And that would have been quite an experience. But he was sailing from Gravesend and he expected that by sp spending some time with his brother in Australia. Once he get to New Zealand, he will catch up with the other settlers in the same area. 
he was traveling as a ship surgeon on the Tasmania. And uh, this was a good opportunity for him because ship surgeons were very uh, rare. There weren't so many medical doctors that would sail over. And if they were, uh, not everybody was really overly excited to work while they were traveling. So uh, the, the ships that were arriving, for example, in Port Chalmers, Henrietta ship, there is a count that uh, there were uh, over 300 passengers that left original place in Glasgow. Uh, arriving at Port Chalmers, there was a death of 31 people during the trip. And some of them were complaining that it was due to a surgeon who was drunken most of the time and didn't take care of the passengers that caused so many deaths. So ship surgeons weren't always very present. And in case of some epidemic outbreaks on the ships, uh, very often the outcome was unfortunately lethal. So many did not even take, uh, didn't even get to the shores of New Zealand. He was lucky because on the ship Tasmania, he met some of his friends from Edinburgh, James and George Titlers, two brothers, and there was also their cousin Edward William Stafford. So he was not alone and they were just making the most of the time on the ship. When he arrived in Australia on the 14th of September, 1841. So he left on the 11th of May, arrived in Australia on the 14th of September. He, uh, the, the ship anchored in Williamstown, which was about eight miles from Melbourne. His first account of Melbourne was quite a, quite a bit of disappointment. Um, there was not much, not that we see Melbourne today, definitely far from it. But um, Melbourne did not impress him. His brother, Harry, he established himself as a sheep farmer. And there was a station in Camp, uh, Campaspe Plains that was about 80 miles from Melbourne. So they traveled together from Melbourne to Campaspe Plains. And um, I believe that they had a lot of time or plenty of time to talk about sheep farming, uh, Harry's uh, uh, start, how he established himself and his experience of the world down under. In 1843, so it is two years later, Harry became the owner of 70,000 acres at Crawford River in Portland Bay. And he was considered quite a good employer because he had 30 farm workers. He had 6,000 sheep, 500 cattle, 30 horses. So he was doing really very well. So what did David do? Well, he arrived in New Zealand in early January, 1842. Uh, he left Australia, sorry, he left Australia in early January on the schooner Ariel. And a few days later, uh, he arrived in Auckland on 17th of January, 1842. And his impression of Auckland was also nothing special. There were barely 400 houses. Uh, I believe, that he was not sure what he would find in New Zealand. So he made sure that he always has a backup plan, which is one of the characteristics of all the Monroes. If something doesn't work well, there is always a backup plan that will work well. So he left his luggage and a dog at Harry's. Well, I understand him. Uh, later on, we will see that he would go uh, to pick up his luggage and his dog. And as a, um, a great pet lover like myself, we have seven cats. I can fully understand why wouldn't he leave the dog in Australia? He had to have his dog with him. I would do exactly the same. So when he arrived in Auckland on 17th of January, 1842, he uh, sailed along the coast of New Zealand uh, to reach the Nelson, where he was, where he get a plot of land. While he was sailing along the coast of New Zealand, he 
uh, wrote that he was very kindly received by Maori. Uh, he said that he felt quite as secure among them both as regard life and property as I should be among my countrymen. So his first impression of the new culture, Maori, was very, very positive. He's, probably he was very surprised at the way Maori uh, do their ta tattoos, tamoko. And he was, I dare say, he was impressed because his expression of how well the, the facial tattoo was made was with mathematical exactitude. So the symmetry that they that they um, uh, painted their faces was so uh, well done that impressed David. And please, let not forget that he was a very good observer, not only prolific writer, not only a good medical practitioner, but he was a very good observer. We will see later more of his observations. So comparing to Australia and its dryness, he was definitely impressed with New Zealand nature and the luscious vegetation. So that's probably what also attracted him to New Zealand more than Australia. So his medical observations were recorded and he uh, gave account of what kind of diseases or what was the first hand impression of the issues, the health issues that were uh, that he faced. So he said that one in at least eight have eye inflammation. He also noted that uh, one case in one case there was a blindness. He noted ulceration of cornea, scrofulous affection of the glands of the neck, which I believe were swellings of the lymph nodes, and also uh, an old woman with a very bad cough and copious expectoration which is the sign of, obviously, tuberculosis. He arrived in Nelson in March 1842, and upon his arrival, there were already 1,500 of his countrymen there, and they were waiting for the allotment distribution. Most of those people uh, that... Uh, immigrated to New Zealand were intellectuals and highly educated persons. David fell in love with Nelson and according to Captain Wakefield's account, he was becoming a hearty Nelsonite, which is quite nice for a new person arriving to a new country to feel that way. Troubles in paradise have started, and particularly with the issues uh, regarding the land allotments between the New Zealand company and the land owners. In this case, these were Maori. And David Monro was leader of land owners in negotiations. Now, if you allow me, I would like to read to you what uh, was, um, what consisted the land for purchase that was uh, that cost 300 pounds so that was one land allotment the cost was 300 pounds and it consisted of one town acre 50 acres of suburban land and 150 acres of rural land rural land so david monroe purchased four allotments so that means he would have about 200 acres of suburban land, 600 acres of rural land, and four town acres, which not everybody got as they were expected, expecting to. A little bit more about David in his first days. Um, I've already said that he was a tradition breaker because he didn't continue as a professor of anatomy. Um, he was an artist, he was a botanist, he was, he was a medical professional, but coming to New Zealand, he became a landover, a justice of peace, a sheep farmer. Later on, we will see he will become a fruit grower, a keen gardener, a politician, you name it. 
So he, in his purchase for the uh, of land, he got lot four four one in Trafalgar Square, uh, and he built there a brick house as an accommodation house, which was run by Mrs. Taylor. Later on, we will see that his main house was in Waimea. And so whenever he was in Nelson, he would stay at that inn, which was run by Mrs. Taylor. It was his, but it was run as an inn. So David lived in Waimea uh, at the land called Beercroft, section 61, in Waimea West. And he got, he gave that name again, according to the first of the five generation of his ancestors, Sir Alexander uh, Monroe of Beercroft. So you, we can see how very influential his um, ancestral roots were in his new life in New Zealand. In May 1842, he was appointed the first Justice of Peace in New Zealand. A month later, in June 1842, he went back to Australia on Bark Eagle to collect luggage and his dog, Oscar. Now, we can see that everything has been going on so rapidly. And, and it is a little bit, um, I would say, too fast even to today's standard. He only arrived in Nelson in uh, January. Um, 1842, and in May he was already Justice of Peace and he got his uh, allotment and he in June he went back and so everything was so, so fast. Um, but life was back then like that. Um, people try to do the maximum of it, try to settle and try to uh, start their families and start their businesses as quickly as they could. Six months later, on the 12th of January, which is just one year after he initially arrived in New Zealand, he came back to Nelson, this time not just with his luggage and with his dog Oscar, but with 300 sheep, some cattle, and also his uh, friend Edward Stafford, who was the cousin of his uh, titleist friends that they were uh, sailing together on the boat Tasman from uh, Edinburgh to um, Australia. Now, because of land disputes, and let me remind you again, uh, David Monroe was the principal negotiation, negotiator uh, between the settlers and the landowners. There was a very misfortunate accident in Vairau in June 1843. So what happened? Um, it was believed that Captain Wakefield purchased land from the Maori uh, land for the New Zealand Company in 1839. Uh, there are disputes that not all the land was legally obtained. And in need for more land, there was a work party that was sent to survey the land in Wairau, to which the Maori objected. Now, the Nelson police magistrate, Thompson, he issued a warrant for arrest of the uh, uh, chieftains of Nai, uh, Nati uh, Toa, Te Rauparaha and Te Rangi Hayata. So they went there with the intention to bring to police magistrate uh, those two um, Maori uh, chieftains. Captains Wakefield and Captain Wakefield and Captain England, they led that armed party. And in order to have any signature in all those deeds and uh, settlements negotiations, along came two justices of peace to verify those, those uh, um, uh, signatures. David Monroe, who was also a justice of peace, and his friend James. Tatler, um, they walked from, my, from Waimea to Nelson, and luckily so, uh, their initial uh, idea was to accompany the party so they could also go with them to Wairea. Luckily, they didn't. Luckily, they were late for the ship uh, because they were spared in the massacre. Unfortunately, 
22 Europeans were killed, including uh, Wakefield and both uh, justices of peace. Um, Maoris also were killed, unfortunately, and 27 who survived of those settlers, of the, of the Europeans, they returned to Nelson. So that has also prompted the early settlers that the uh, experience uh, would make them very uncomfortable and be a little bit cautious around Maori because there was always that land dispute that hasn't been resolved, unfortunately, to some of the areas even today. Uh, David Mondra was traveling throughout New Zealand, throughout South Island, and in 1844, when uh, a group of Scottish settlers uh, wanted to move to Otago area, uh, there was a party uh, that uh, preceded uh, their move, uh, led by uh, New Zealand uh, Company's chief surveyor, Friedrich Tucker, to inspect the land for their arrival in Otago, and David went along with him in 1844. Uh, unfortunately, this uh, arrangement fell through, and the Scottish did not arrive in Otago until 1848. On their way to Otago, uh, to Dunedin, what is now Dunedin, and uh, further on to Clotha, uh, they stopped at Waikowaiti and visited John Jones's whaling station, which is today we can see it at Manakana Farm. I've got some photos later on and I'll show you. Uh, at that time, so we are talking about 1844. Officially, the Scottish settlers have not arrived in um, New uh, in uh, Dunedin uh, until 1848. But there were 25 white residents in Otago, and according to uh, David Monroe, they lived in decent houses and rather comfortably. David Monroe enjoyed the nature and Otago Harbour. He traveled also to Invercargill. He bought a property in Invercargill and in 1867, he dedicated a Q Road, which ran through his property and that there is a plaque at the hospital, Q Hospital in Invercargill, also mentioning um, David Monroe. Here, uh, I had the pleasure of going with my husband uh, not so long ago to Manakana Farm. This is the John Jones's whaling station. And these are just a few of the photos that we can see there is a little history about uh, the development and what Mana uh, Matanaka Farm was like. Here is, uh, there. there is a uh, there are five buildings here. In one of them is like a little school. Here we can see a little little classroom, and then there is the stables for the horses. And in one of the of these buildings is also um, like um, a, a boat made of um, canvas. So on the outside there is a canvas, and of course here is the made of some branches and the wood. Uh, in the in uh, the whaling station, we can see uh, there are comments uh, that uh, the David Monroe wrote about his impression of Waikawaiti and uh, what he found there, how he experienced the whole the whole that part of New Zealand. It is. Uh, Interesting to say that uh, David Monroe came as a bachelor, but he did not stay as the one for a very long time. And on 24th November 1843, at the bachelor's ball, he met his future wife, Dina Seckler, sorry, Seckler, uh, and he didn't like her name, so he called her Nina. Uh, she uh, her mother died when she was very young, and her father was killed in one robbery gone wrong. So she, in order to survive, she became a dairy maid to Honorable Constantine and Fanny Dillon. As things would 
progress very fast. So they, they met in, on, in November. They already got married on 7th of May, 1845. And this would be, if you remember, he left the shores of Scotland on the 11th of May, 1842. Only three years later, he would already be a married man. Uh, on his wedding day, there were 30 guests in attendance and there was a banquet um, thrown by the uh, Constantine and Fanny Dillon. They had seven children. Uh, Alexander was born the following year. So here we again have Alexander, but he's neither Quartus or Quintus. We've got David, uh, who died young without any issue. And then there was Maria Georgina, 1848, James, who also died the same year, so he was just a baby. Charles was born in 1851, Constance Charlotte, 1853, Henry James uh, Carmichael, who died also very young at the age of six. Whenever he, uh, David wrote letters, and he was in a very uh, intensive communication, particularly with his youngest sister, Charlotte, he always wrote very lovingly and um, uh, with a lot of affection about his wife. So here we've got uh, David Monroe's family. This is his wife, Dina. And uh, the pedigree uh, that I've got here uh, is taken from the book by local historian Clive Akers, Monroe, The Life and Times of the Man Who Gave New Zealand Rugby, which is the book about rugby history in New Zealand and David's son, Charles, who was the one that, as they say, brought um, rugby to New Zealand from England. So Charles is here, this one. David was a very busy man. He was not just a sheep farmer, even though we see that he had approximately 20,000 sheep, which makes me think, oh, he probably was a little bit competitive, which is also one of the traits of the Monroes. They like to be the best, so he was probably better than his brother, doing better than his brother. He was into fruit growing. Um, he was famous for his award-winning apples and peaches. He grew watermelon, cherries, plums, pears, grapes, you name it. And uh, gardening was his principal hobby. Because of the uh, tensions with Maori. Uh, in 1844, uh, uh, the, the settlers uh, established militia, and uh, he was uh, um, he was appointed in April 1845 by the governor Fitzroy as captain in the Nelson Battalion of militia. Just I would say it was. Uh, they, I believe they all wanted to live in peace, but it was just a sort of precaution given the uh, massacre that happened only two years before. Uh, he was also a property investor. He owned properties in Waimea, where he lived, in Motueka. So his land covered 36,000 acres. He had two sections in Nelson, three in Collingwood, he had land in Picton, in Bercargill, 200 acres, the one that I've already mentioned, and he also had some land in Wairau Valley. Apart from being a busy man, um, farmer, uh, agricultural uh, man, uh, orchard growing, uh, uh, very, very busy. He was also a writer and an artist. And here we have um, a pen uh, that was a pen and the ink that was um, that you can find in the Nelson's Provincial Museum. And I would like to use this opportunity to thank their archivist, Karen, who's sending me the photos of these items. So he wrote diaries, journals, letters. Um, he also left some drawings. Uh, here on the left, we've got 
Primus's Life of Dr. Alexander Monroe in his own handwriting, the, something that I mentioned in the beginning. So you can see he was very meticulous, very detailed, very patient in his writing, and so was David. So this is the, the page from uh, David's um, uh, item that we have in the special collections. There are two of them here in Otago. More of them are at Alexander Turnbull uh, Library in Wellington and also in Nelson Provincial Museum. Here we have, uh, all, although um, it was uh, drawn by pencil, so it's not very visible, not very sharp, and it's just on the cover of one of his diaries. And here are just some of the uh, pages that, from the items that we've got here in a, a special collection. And I quite like the one that says, um, uh, presented by Dr. Uh, uh, J.E. Uh, Monroe of Palmerston North, and it was in 1969. So uh, here I, well, as a very romantic person uh, coming from south of Europe, I thought that these dried flowers were uh, his memory that he wanted to take with him from beloved Scotland. However, I was wrong. It is very likely that he was um, drying the plants and flowers that he found in New Zealand, and he was sending it to his friend, who was director of the botanical garden, uh, gardens at Kew in England, so he wanted to show them what grows well in New Zealand. So he was a politician and a speaker in the period of 1861 to 1870. Uh, he was, I believe, even when he was uh, a boy, that he should hear uh, elderly, his father, his grandfather, father, talking about the politics, what was going on in Edinburgh, in Scotland, um, discussing with various people, friends who would pop in. So he was probably n uh, not new to politics. So when he moved, when he started his life independently, he probably thought it would be a good thing to get involved in politics for the benefit of the new settlers in, in the country. So in 1853, he became the member in the House of Representatives for Vimea West, which he um, did in the period from 53 to 55, and again for the two-year period in 1858 to 1860. On uh, 16th of February in 1861, he was unopposedly elected as a member for Picton, which he served for eight years. He was also a member for Chevio for four years, Motueka in 1871, and in Waikowaiti, 1872 to 73. Uh, I find it a little bit unusual that he was, he lived in Waimea West. He was uh, near Nelson. Waikowaiti is here, down south here in, in Otago. You know, what, what do these two areas have in common that he was the representative? Or maybe, I don't know, maybe he, the, the area did not have very prominent politicians who would be loud enough to, to speak on behalf of the people there. I don't know. On 3rd of June, 1861, he, was, uh, he became a speaker in the House of Representatives. And he was, despite not being a lecturer, despite not being a medical professional himself, he was very much in support of culture and education. He was, for example, one of the foundation members of the Council of Governors of Nelson College. He was very well involved and informed about the medical sector. For example, he took active uh, involvement in the process of medical registration. All his engagement, all his activities, everything came to, a, I would say, a crown in his career with a knighthood in 1866. And here again, uh, I would like to thank Karen uh, for sending me the uh, photo of this um, 
proclamation uh, of his knighthood, where Queen Victoria, by the grace of God, uh, granted, uh, uh, granted, and this presents, so give a grant unto our trusted and well-beloved David Monroe, Esquire Speaker of the House of Representatives in the Our Colony of New Zealand, the degree, title, honor, and dignity of a Knight Bachelor, together with all rights, procedures, privileges, and advantages to the same, degree, title, honor, and dignity belonging or appertaining. So that was really a crown. Again, the history repeats itself, just like his great-great-grandfather, Sir Alexander Monroe, who was knighted, Sir David was knighted. So it's, it all stays in the family. Now, David Monroe never really retired. He made his will on 7th of September, 1876, and he died only a few months later at his home in Newstead. He was buried at Wakapuaka Cemetery in Nelson. So he, was, he died on the 15th of February, 1877. And as if he felt that his time comes to an end, he made the will. And in his will, what I found very interesting, it is only several pages, um, he bequeathed the picture, for example, the picture of two female heads for the cartoon of Massacre of the Innocents by Raphael to Royal Scottish Academy to be displayed in some public gallery in Edinburgh. And what is also interesting is it, it is written that the picture to be carefully packed and transmitted to Edinburgh at the cost of his estate. He was really thinking of everything and everybody. He also made sure that everybody was well provided, particularly um, uh, that they were never short of funds or that they had place to live. But for the Monroe collection that we so proudly um, have here in, in the University of Otago, uh, because he did not have male heirs who were in medicine, he bequeathed the Monroe collection to his son-in-law, Dr. James Hector, who was practice, practicing a uh, physician. So, I had the immense opportunity and I was uh, so grateful to talk to John Monroe of Palmerston North, uh, who also told me a few things that are interesting for his family and also for the new generation of um, the Monroes here in New Zealand. So when I spoke to him and the first impression I must say was when I saw John via Zoom, uh, I immediately thought, gosh, this is Secundus. He looks so identical, facial features reminded me so much of Secundus. And the more I was digging through the current generation of, of uh, the Mondras here in New Zealand, I could recognize the facial features, like there was um, the Paul um, Monroe. He, he particularly looks very much, in my opinion, like Secundus. And there is a lot of love and um, pride for his ancestors. And this is what, in the end of my, my conversation with John, I noted. We all love, we all have love of science and art. We are inherently reasonable and with strong values. And we are proud of our Scottish ancestry. Uh, thank you, John. I really appreciate talking to me. Now, we are in New Zealand, and there are very many Monroe descendants as the next generation. So, uh, yes, there are many doctors, lawyers, but uh, as one of them said, uh, their career choice diversified. Given the strong influence and importance of their ancestors, I think it would be interesting to make a talk about 
well, where is the, the current generation of the Mondrez? What are they doing? Because we do know that there are a lot of scientists, uh, um, a lot of uh, um, uh, acclaimed uh, artists, and they are really making a huge impact to the New Zealand society today. So yes, it would be lovely to have um, one of the talks dedicated to the next generation of Mondros. And with that in mind, I would like to thank you for your attention and hope to see you in some of the next lectures. Thank you kindly. Thank you, Mariella. Um, questions? Um, Mariella, can I ask the, um, uh, are the descendants of Dave, this David, the uh, only source of the Munros in New Zealand. Did any other Scottish Munros come to New Zealand? You know, apart from David, I mean, in other words, are all the current people in New Zealand from Munros descended of the David? I know that uh, some of children, David's children, they went to Scotland. Uh, for example, John's father, who was a medical profession, a, prof a medical student, uh, and then later worked as a medical pr uh, medical practitioner. Uh, he went to some additional training back to Edinburgh, to Scotland. I know that uh, while he was there, um, I know that Charles Monroe, or, uh, also the one who brought who brought the rugby to New Zealand, he was in England, and I know that. Um, uh, Piera MacArthur, she is a famous, famous artist. That's John's sister. She was born in England, but then they came back to. Yeah. to so I think there is a lot of connection, but yes. still connection between um, Scotland or England and and New Zealand. Yeah. And I think that, um, as I said, I would like everybody or whoever can to read Clive Acker's book on. Charles Monroe, because there is a lot of written about the descendants, so Charles and later generation. So it's very interesting. Um, can I just say one one other thing about um, when I look at the photos of the contemporary of of the current Monroes, they all look so much like like Secundus. They all have the the facial features that are so similar to to old Monroes, so to say, to the Scottish Monroes. No, no, can, can you just read out slowly the title and the author for those people who are Zooming and cannot see that? So the book is called Monroe, The Life and Times of the Man Who Gave New Zealand Rugby. And the author is Clive Aukers, 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 A. K-E-R-S. Clive is local historian from Manawatu. So he's um, he, he researched very much. And uh, Clive was also a secretary of New Zealand Rugby Museum for very many years. So Palmerston North is all about rugby. And if you ever happen to be in Palmerston North, I suggest you go and see um, Massey University campus, the Sir Jeffrey Perrin building that has been lovingly restored. And also Te Manawa, Museum and the Rugby Museum. That's that's my recommendation. And there are quite few of um, Monroe David's descendants that live still in Palmerston North, like John Monroe. Um, uh, I think Hugh lives in uh, Taupo. Uh, Piera is in Wellington. So they are they are still here. They are still around. You questioned why David Monroe might come to New Zealand. I think you need to look back at the Scottish situation at that time when um, education, medical education and religion were closely associated and the Presbyterian Church of Scotland, which was such an influence on, on the Scottish people, was going through a major disruption as to whether they um, were accepting the sort of political controls or the Con controls of the um, diocese and in, in um, no, and that led to a lot of a lot of the breakup of of Scottish families and coming out to New Zealand.
Some of the Monroes in New Zealand spell their name with an E on the end. Is that a separate family altogether or do they stem from a similar root? That's a very good question. That's something that I would like to know because I also noticed that some of them do have that E at the end and some don't. Um, I think that all the Monroes that stem from Sir Alexander Monroe uh, five generations ago don't have the E. So it's, a, it's also an interesting thing to look further. Those with E, do they stem from the same, the, from the same family tree or not? Uh, there is another thing that I've also noticed is that there is in every generation, there is an Alexander, but there has never been Alexander Quartus. Quintus, Sextus, Septimus, Octavus. And, but there is, in every generation, there is an Alexander. But no, so with Tertius, that, that kind of tradition breaking, that's why I also in my, in my introduction that you got in, in the invitation, I called him a tradition breaker because he decided to break with the tradition of being successor of the chair of anatomy and professor. And he decided to take a completely different route. And yes, probably he was trying to escape the politics and, and the un, uh, unrest times in Scotland. But he then came to New Zealand and then he also tried to make the best for the settlers. He was a very, very, um, as I said earlier, uh, academically, he may not have been a plus student. But he was a man who used his brain, who was curious. He was very much like Secundus. Secundus was a keen gardener. He was art lover. He was um, uh, going to the theaters. He loved music. He was, they, they were people of so many talents and skills. He came to New Zealand with nothing on. All he did was he visited his brother who he saw did very well for him. I think his brother, uh, Harry, he had 10 children. So he found his fortune there. And that must have been, he was older than, than David, and that must have been, okay, a kind of motivation. If he could do it, I could do it. And he was, he was just, he was very good at that. <laughs> 